Where we left off last week is, is God is still giving the instructions on preparation for preparing the tabernacle for use. The tabernacle, as we've seen so clearly, is a place where the people of God practice the presence of God, right? Amen? We're all on that page, I think. The whole intent or purpose for the purpose of the tabernacle was simply that people could remain in a relationship, an active, thriving, uh, conscience-clearing friendly relationship with the Lord. It's the whole reason God brought them out of Egypt in the first place was to have a relationship with them. So now we're continuing in the instructions God is giving to Moses, and now this is the ordination ceremony and the, and the daily offerings over seven days and, 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 and getting Aaron and his sons ready to serve and minister to help people with their offerings. Remember last week we talked about wave offerings, we talked about grain offerings, we talked about uh, you know, sin offerings and, and all the five different types. And by the way, those five different types were just one man's opinion. Who knows, you could divide it up into seven types or however you see it, not an issue. But the point is, is that this was all about God wanting to be closer to His people. And here's the cool thing, none of that's changed. That's what God wants right now. You're here tonight. God wants desperately to be even closer to you than you already are. And now, if you think you're close to God now, praise the Lord. But you can be even closer. There's always closer. There's always closer. And if you really want to be close to the Lord, um, no, never mind. I'm not going to say that. We have security guards, armed security guards in the back that can help you with that. I'm just kidding. Anyway, (laughs) verse 38. There we go. There's those hacks. I mean, that's all. Listen, the Lord's going to take even that away, you know? Someday, verse 38, now this is what you shall offer on the altar, two lambs on the, uh, uh, of the first year, one year old, within the, the, their first year of their, of their life, day by day continually, one lamb you shall offer in the morning and the other lamb you shall offer at twilight, with one lamb shall be one-tenth of an ephah of flour mixed with one-fourth of a hin of pressed oil and one-fourth of a hin of wine as a drink offering. And the other lamb you shall offer at twilight, and you shall offer it with the grain offering and with the drink offering, as in the morning for the sweet aroma of the offering made by fire to the Lord. This shall be a continual burnt offering throughout your generations at the door of the tabernacle of meeting before the Lord, where I will meet with you and speak with you. Those are key words there. Again, we'll talk about that in a minute. God saying, I want to meet with you and speak with you. And, I, and there I will meet with the children of Israel, and, and the tabernacle shall be sanctified by my glory, God says. All this stuff that they do, remember, all this, so much stuff that they do, right? All this work that they do, none of it sanctifies anything. All of it is, an, is work by faith to be in the presence of God that God's presence would sanctify it. So I will, God says, verse 44, Consecrate the tabernacle of meeting, it's, that's what it's actually called, the tabernacle of meeting, and the altar. I will also consecrate both Aaron and his sons to minister, which we all know means to serve me as priests. I will dwell among the children of Israel, I will be their God, and they shall know that I am the Lord their God, who brought them up out of the land of Egypt, that I might dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. Let's read a little bit more, let's read all the way through to chapter 30, verse 10. Verse 1 says, you shall make an altar to burn incense on. You shall make it out of acacia wood. It shall be a cubit and a half in length. Cubit, it's width. We already read this uh, in previous chapters, but just a recounting of this. It shall be be square with two cubits, uh, and and two cubits its height, it is. And its horns shall be of one piece with it, and you shall overlay its top, its sides all around, and its horns with pure gold, and you shall make for it moldings of gold all the way around to Two gold rings you shall make for it under the molding. It's kind of like the big altar in the middle of the tabernacle, the same shape and size, only this is wrapped with gold. Under the moldings on its both sides, you shall place them on its two sides, and there will be holders with poles in it uh, with which you are to bear or carry it with. And you shall make the poles of acacia wood, overlay them with gold, and you shall put it before the veil that is before the ark of the testimony, before the mercy seat, That is over the testimony where I will meet with you. Aaron shall burn on it sweet incense every morning when he tends the lamps, and he shall burn incense on it. And Aaron, and when Aaron lights the lamps at twilight, he shall burn incense on it 
a perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. You shall not offer strange incense on it or burnt offerings or a grain offering, nor shall you pour drink offering on it. And Aaron shall make atonement upon its horns once a year with the blood of the sin offering atonement. Once a year he shall make atonement upon it throughout your generations. It is most holy to the Lord. So last week, as I, again, I'll, I'm just going to remind you real quick, there's the five different types of offering that we sort of talked about. The burnt offering was voluntary, the grain offering was voluntary, the peace offering was voluntary, the sin offering was mandatory, the trespass offering was man- mandatory. Those were specifically required in order to cover sin. Now remember, everything that was a payment for sin was not an actual payment for sin. What it really was was a covering that was temporary in nature until you had to cover the next sin. And really, why, why did it need to be covered? Because you couldn't have it uncovered and have a relationship with God. And again, that, that's, that's always been true, and it's still true today. Well, our, we don't need a covering for sin on a daily basis today because when we came to our relationship with God, we came through Jesus, right? And the shed blood of Jesus Christ It doesn't cover our sin, it actually erases and removes our sin. The Bible literally says in the Psalms, as far as the east is from the west, that's how far He's removed our sin from us. Now, if you've never thought about the actual reality of what that means, as far as the east is from the west, take a moment, if you will, and picture in your mind a globe, one of the ones that sat on your teacher's desk, or maybe you have one at home in your office. Now, if you start at the equator, and you run your finger up the globe and you get to the tip where, you know, where, the, where the rod and the bearing are, that's the North Pole, right? If you move your finger in any direction from that point, what direction are you going? South. But if you keep going all the way around to the bottom where the other pin and bearing are, you're at the South Pole, right? And if you move your finger in any direction from there, you're headed north. If you go to the equator again and you start running your finger east or you start running your finger west, I'm sorry, for you guys it would be west and east, sorry, backwards, right? You can, go as, you can just continuously keep going. You're never going to reach the opposite. If, you, if you're going east, you're just, you continually are moving in the east. You never, you never arrive at west. In the same, there is no west pole, there is no north pole. So in our minds, we understand they never again meet with us. Our sin is completely permanently removed. That's the difference in the quality of the blood of Jesus Christ versus all the blood of anything that's ever lived on earth. Nothing can compare to the blood of Jesus Christ. And so we see in all these, in all these sacrifices the cost of sin. Think about this. Every day you're bringing these val- these a- no, listen, these animals were precious. They were valuable. It was your food. It was how you made your living, right? I mean, you would use these things to plow fields and to do various things. You got milk from them, so on and so forth. Whatever kind of animal it was, they were important to your, li- your livelihood. And here they are just voluntarily bringing them to the altar. Why? Because their relationship with God needed to be more important than anything earthly or worldly. They had, all, they had the best of all the earth had to offer in Egypt. Think about it. The fertile plains of Egypt, I mean, the most advanced of everything, you know, you could possibly get. I think they actually had AM and FM radios back in in Egypt, if I'm not, in their chariots, they had AM and FM. But they had everything back then, and it was the, on earth, there wasn't a better place. There wasn't. So God breaks them free from a place that, that had the best of everything, including all the, the, the most amount of wealth in the entire world, and breaks them free from there and brings them to where? The wilderness. You're like, oh, that makes perfect sense. I got a couple million people with nothing to do with I'm going to take them out into the desert where there's nothing, right? Why? To prove to them that He is all they need. He gave them everything they needed when they left. They, they go to your neighbor's house, ask them, you know, whatever they might want to offer to you. You don't have to take it. Just ask for it. They're going to be so broken, they'll give you everything. And that's exactly, when they left Egypt, they had so much stuff with them, you know? And, and it wasn't about the stuff, because later on, all the stuff became building materials for the tabernacle. It was nothing. It was meaningless. They had everything they needed. But consider that the cost of sin is great. That hasn't changed. That hasn't changed. What, is, what does sin cost us? When we realize that what, what all these sacrifices are about, what does sin cost us? It costs us intimacy with God. You know, I mean, honestly, there's nothing that we should want more in our lives, and perhaps that's the question for us as we sit here tonight. How much do we want 
How close do we really want to be with God? And what things are signs to us that we maybe should want to be closer to God, you know? And the question I have as I thought about these verses of Scripture tonight is, why does worship of anything other than God result in emptiness? I had a person recently say to me, an, an adult, I think it was a woman said this to me. She said she was talking to some you know, young, very successful in terms of earthly success, young man recently, and she was getting to know him for the first time, and she asked him you know, what it is that he does, and he started to tell her what it was that he did for a living, and in listening to him, realized very quickly that this man's very wealthy. And his family's blessed and they have everything. I mean, he's got everything earthly that he could possibly hope or want for. And you know what he said to her? But lately I just, it's just not, there's something missing. It's just not enough. I'm missing something. Actually, you know, I didn't remember who it was now. It was the doctor. It was the doctor at the doctor's office I went to. And now I'm getting to use that <laughs> for, for a sermon example. You know what I, this is what the Lord gave me to say to her. Hold on, let me. I said, you know, I believe that human beings are made up of three things, body, soul, and spirit. We call it a trichotomy, the trichotomy of humanity. It's, a, you know, it's just a theory. I believe like the image of God, Father, Son, and Spirit, we are three things, body, soul, and spirit. And most people today are so focused on one-third of what they are, flesh, body. They're so focused on that. Why? Well, that's everything tangible. You know, it's the world. It's everything you can touch and feel and smell and that, that, that hugs you back or tells you you're great or, you know, or you, can, you, know, you can actually look in the checkbook and see how much money you have and all that stuff. That's all physical. It's earthly. But guess what? That's everything that's temporal. We have a soul and a spirit. And unless we equally tend to those two things... When we tend to those things, by the way, that other one-third gets put in its place. It's not that it doesn't have a place in our lives. It has a place. Material things have a place in our lives. God, some, God gives us material things, and we get to use them for His glory. Amen? Amen. And I, mean, I get, God blesses some people, you know, in a certain way, and, and some people have very little, and they're more blessed than anybody. So really, it's not about how much stuff you have, is it? No. It's not about that. But unless you balance out these three things, there's going to be an emptiness. So why does the worship of anything other than God result in emptiness? I'll tell you why, in my opinion. Because only God will act upon your worship to bless you. Nothing else will receive your worship and give you back. Nothing else gives you back. It only takes from you your worship. Everything else takes from you. God and God alone is so blessed to have your attention and your affection and your... That's what worship is. That's what worship is. It's your turning your affection onto something so much so that what that person wants or thinks or whatever it is that you're worshiping, whatever that's about, you, that matters more to you than anything. If God is that person in your life, then you're going to receive back from that. And that's what I love about it. There are about... As I, I went through the whole book of Exodus today. I read through the whole thing to find out how many times in the book of Exodus the words, the two words, I will, appear in reference to something God does in order to answer the cry of His people. What do I mean by the cry of His people? You see, as I pointed out before, the three-part division of Exodus, you have the first 15 chapters are sort of a picture of salvation, right? How people get saved out of the world. The second you know, set or the second of the one-third is that center section where God prepares the people to, for, for a lifetime of worship, it's like a process of sanctifying them. And in the, in the third and final section, which we're getting to, right, as we get into chapter 31, we'll see that it's worship. It's about them worshiping the Lord and practicing the presence of God uh, every day. But, but we, we learn there in chapter 3, verse 7, in the book of Exodus, the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. God sees, He hears, and He knows. And guess what? He allows the sorrows for what purpose? That we would cry out. He answers their cries. But in, in order for, they're not going to cry out until they realize that the world is not a place for them. It's not a place to want. And until we realize that we need to say no to the world in order to say yes to God, we're not really crying out. 
And, and so that it, the relationship begins when our hearts are stirred and we see our need for Him and we begin to cry out. And God then says, and I promised I would tell you how many times, 88 times in the book of Exodus alone, the words, I will appear in reference to what God did or God does to draw us out of the world, draw us away from ourselves, sanctify us, cleanse us, purify our lives, all that stuff. I will, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. Your only part is the desire, the worship. That's your role. All God says is, let, put your, delight yourself in the Lord and I will give you the desires of your heart. People love the second part of that. God will give you the desires of your heart. Well, whoa, wait a second now. Delight yourself in the Lord, and God will give you the desires of your heart. If you're delighting in the Lord, all you want is the Lord. If you want the Lord, God's going to give you the Lord. That's all that means, by the way. Pretty simple statement. God will give you more of Himself if you set your affections on Him. And God says, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will do everything necessary. All you need to do is believe and trust me. Verse 38 again. This is what you shall offer. He's given them instructions of what ceremonial practices they are to do as an effort on their part to keep their lives in check. You see, busyness is a great thing when it's directed in a constructive way, isn't it? And so this tabernacle work, it's all about busyness, about building the house of God. Now, our modern-day tabernacle really is what? Is, isn't it the church? Or the, I, Again, you are the church. It's the sanctuary. It's, it's, the, it's the congregation of the people of God where we come here. And there were people out here today doing work on the building, and, you know, they weren't doing it to impress anybody. They definitely weren't doing it for money. If, you, if you've ever seen the church's bank account, they weren't doing it for that. So it's not about that. <coughs> they weren't doing it to impress God. They're doing it out of the affection of their heart and their desire just to minister to the Lord. And, and I'm, not, I'm not trying to, like, beg you to come out and do work. We always have people to work. I mean, that's, that's an awesome thing, you know. But listen, when you consume your mind and your heart, and you're always, every day, you're praying for your church. You know, Lord, use my church. Bring people out, Lord. Cause their, you know, pray for the missionaries that we support. Pray, pray that this church become a, a, a spiritually thriving place in the community. Where the, where the leadership is not compromising by temptation and, the, and everything is in its place and being done to honor and to glorify God. It, it's all a picture of the glory of God because God's dwelling here, you know? And when, we're, when our hearts and our affections and our focus is on that and God gives us then instructions for us to help that process play out, because listen, we'll make room. We'll make room on, on the plow, on, on the handle of the plow for your hands. You want to serve here, man? We'll make room for you, you know? I've always said that. I believe in people being given the opportunity to serve, you know? It's one thing my pastor always exhibited or showed me was that, you know what? You want to serve? He's going to give you an opportunity to serve. Give you an opportunity to fail. That's how you learn. Start serving, you know? I'll deal with the consequences later. Don't worry. <laughs> so, so do this work, he says, offer the lambs the first, of the first year, day by day, continually one lamb shall offer in the morning, one lamb at night. And then one lamb, uh, also with the lamb, one-tenth of an ephah of flour mixed with one-fourth of a hin of pressed oil. A hin, by the way, um, we really honestly don't know what a hin, it's a, it's a, it's a measurement of, a, of, of a, you know, an amount of something, obviously. Most biblical scholars think of it about five liters or close, almost a gallon and a half, okay? So you have one hint or, or, or one-tenth of an ephah of flour mixed with one-fourth of a hint of pressed oil and one-fourth of a hint of wine as a drink offering. Verse 41, the other lamb you shall offer at twilight, and, and with that also grain and drink as in the morning for a sweet aroma and offering made with fire to the Lord. Now, you can start to imagine where the modern-day modern day Christianity gets some of its practices, right? You see where the, some of the stuff's coming from, don't you? You know some of the traditions of some of the churches, perhaps, that you are a part of, these denominational churches that have come up with traditions of men, and they've grabbed stuff from the Old Testament that doesn't appear necessarily in the New Testament, and they've added it to their worship in the new. Now, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. It all is a matter of what it is that you believe it accomplishes when you do it. If you believe that ritualistic practices somehow now all of a sudden earn or deserve something from God, we have a name for that. It's called legalism. 
what you do does not impress God no matter what it's worth. You can light all the candles, burn all the incense, bring all the oil, pour it all over everything. You know, you could change the oil in my truck if you want. Hey, that's a, that's a good idea. That might get you somewhere, actually, if you need a ride. I, I don't know. But in reality, it does nothing. You see, I always, I'm always fond of saying when God blesses you with righteousness and, he, and you, you, know, you seek a relationship with Him and because you have a relationship with Him, He instills righteousness in you and makes you a better person, that that is its own reward. And that serving God is a privilege, not, not, not any, in any way a way to earn yourself a place in, any, in the world, not in any way to impress God or get anything for it. It's not in exchange for something. It is itself the, the blessing to get to be given the opportunity to work and do something for the Lord is a blessing. Some people here picked up a paintbrush today. You can't tell because they were so bad at what they did, but I'm only kidding, just kidding. <laughs> no, actually, I noticed downstairs they took that funky old carpet off the poles in the middle of the basement now. I walked down and these poles are bright white and they look great. I'm thinking, man, praise the Lord. It's just a little bit of effort goes a long way, you know. But there's still a lot, 128-year-old building, there's a lot more to do. There's always a lot to do. We'll always have a place for you to serve. And in doing so, that is a blessing. It's like, you know, people call you up and say, hey, what are you doing Saturday? Let's go wherever. You're like, no, man, I'm, I'm going to my church and I'm, we're, gonna, we're doing this project. And pro what? You're doing what? Why wouldn't you want to come to us? I mean, all right, I'll, I'll give you an example. Come, come with us to the shooting range, you know. Some of, my, some of my buddies are always trying to get me to go to the shooting range. Some of them are actually here tonight, and I'm using this specific example to, to guilt them into coming here to do work, just so you know. <laughs> Maybe they're just embarrassed, they ain't got skills or something, but come to the shooting range. We'll, we'll, we'll huck bullets from one end of a field to another. I'm like, hey, that's fun for every once in a while. I like that too, but no, 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 you know what? Let's go to, let's go to the house of the Lord and serve, you know? Let, let's go... At the end of the day, you feel like, man, I did something for the Lord. I, I'll tell you a quick story. That's probably a lie. I don't know if I've ever told a quick story. When I was coming back to the Lord, I lived a, a, a long time in my life kind of backslidden. And um, I found a non-denominational church not far from here, and I started to go there. It was, it was shortly after I went there in that particular, it wasn't a Calvary Chapel, but that particular pastor, um, you know, he, he noticed that I was just being filled, you know? I hadn't heard the Word of God taught in a long time, and I was just being filled, and he noticed that I was just into it, and he said, hey, you know what? We could really use a hand around here. They were meeting in a school at the time, and there was some chairs set up and stuff going on, and one of the, one of the things was making copies of, of the messages on cassette tapes. I know, isn't that kind of embarrassing, right? Well, yeah, I'm that old. Okay, I just had a birthday, 52. <laughs> cassette tapes, right? So he asked me if I would be willing to help by making these copies. I started crying right there. I know you're like, you guys think I'm probably out of my mind right now. Let me explain. I got saved probably around, I don't know, around nine years old. I was going to church for a while. Somewhere in my, you know, 12, 13 age range there. My parents had some trouble in their marriage. They split up for a little bit. About nine months, six, 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 seven, eight, nine months, they got back together. They're married today. They're attending church. They're doing great. Their, their life is wonderful. But, but back then, we, we ended up not going back to church for the rest of my young years. And so eventually, I just ended up being conformed to the image of my friends, even though I had this inner tugging at me. But I watched as my cousins, all my cousins continued at their churches. They were going on teen mission trips, and they were doing... They were always involved in their youth groups, and there was always this thing in my heart that I felt like, you know, man, look at them and look at me, you know? And they thought I was cool because I was a surfer, skateboarder, snowboarder. I was traveling around the world. I was living out my dreams in, the, in a worldly sense, but I thought, secretly thought they were cool because they were going to Guatemala or wherever, you know? They were going somewhere and serving the Lord, you know? And I thought, man, that's awesome. And then all of a sudden, here's a, here's a pastor saying to me, do you want to serve? We'll let you do this. It, it broke me. It broke me. Because God was saying, you can serve me. That mattered more to me than anything. I, cry, I cried that afternoon. Don't tell my wife, please, guys. Don't tell my wife I cried. Then she's going to want me to cry all the time, and I just can't do it, you know? Anyway, the aroma 
of the offering that rises is not the smell of the stuff that's burning. That's not what makes it sweet. That's not what's sweet about it. What's sweet to God is the affection that was behind it and the faith that was accompanied with it to bring it and to sacrifice it to Him. Otherwise, there's nothing meaningful to it at all. It was meaningful because God loved the fact that people brought it with a desire in their heart to have a relationship with Him. Maybe that's why you're here tonight. I just want to know God better. That's the right reason, right? Amen? Verse 42 says, this shall be a continual burnt offering throughout your generations at the door of the tabernacle, the meeting of the Lord. Again, look very closely here, please, with me, where God says now, I will meet with you and speak with you. Does God want to talk to us or not? And there I will meet with the children of Israel, and the tabernacle shall be sanctified by what? His glory. And here's another I will. I will consecrate, which we all know is a word of separation, other than not common, it's now separate for an eternal purpose. Consecrate the tabernacle of the meeting, it has an eternal purpose, it, it, it has a purpose that's otherworldly of meeting and the altar, and I will also consecrate both Aaron and his sons so that they can serve me as priests. And we know, and I'll remind you again, First Peter very clearly says it, John says it in Revelation, we are priests. Every one of us are priests now. We have no choice. That's the, when we accepted Christ as our Savior, we entered into a priesthood where we do the same thing that Aaron and his sons did. We, we minister to God, and we minister for God to the people. What are we doing? We're standing in the gap between people and their need to know God, right? Again, verse 45, I will dwell. Dwell is a word of the presence, continuous presence of God. I will live there. I will dwell among the children of Israel, and I will be their God. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God, who brought them up out of the land of Egypt, that I might dwell among them. Dwell among them, there appears. I am the Lord their God. So there's no doubt God makes it clear just who does the sanctifying and what God's purpose is for it all. He will sanctify, He will consecrate, and He wants to be with us and have a relationship with us, the reason behind all of it. As we get into chapter 30 now, it says in verse 1, you shall make an altar. This is not the altar out in the middle of the courtyard, obviously. This is the one, just it's the last thing perhaps uh, right there before Aaron would go in once a year into the Holy of Holies in the holy place. This is that, that first room that you went into. Uh, uh, 30 feet deep of a room, 15 feet wide by 15 feet high. Uh, the, 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 the back wall of it was the, the curtain, the curtain of separation. And right before you would go past that curtain to go into the, the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant was, once a year the high priest only would be this altar made out of acacia wood. We learn here its height, its width, <laughs> the shape being square, two cubits, uh, its height, horns on the corners, the same uh, design, not nearly as big as, the, as the, the altar out in the courtyard, overlay its top, its sides all around, and its horns with all, all with pure gold. Remember now, gold, uh, everything on the inside in the presence of God had to be gold, the best of everything, uh, because it's the purest, right? The closest to God is, is pure, purity, right? So, and you shall make it for a molding of gold all the way around, two rings you shall make for it under the moldings on both sides, and then also you put poles in it just like you did for the table of the showbread and the Ark of the Covenant with the rings, with the poles, so that if they had to move it, that's how they carried it. The altar of incense was made of acacia wood, as we said before, laid over 18 inches by three feet high. The altar of incense was also carried in the system, as I said before, in the same way as the other items. Verse 6, you shall put it before the veil, that is, before the ark of the testimony, before the mercy seat that is over the testimony, where I will meet with you and deal with the problem of sin and make sure that that sin is covered so that I can continue in a relationship with my people. Aaron shall burn on it sweet incense every morning. When he tends the lamps, he shall burn incense on it. And, and when Aaron lights the lamps at twilight, he shall burn incense on it, a perpetual incense for the Lord throughout all your generations. You shall not offer strange incense on it or burn. What is strange incense, you know? 
We don't do what we want. We don't offer to God whatever we decide we want to offer to God. It's specifically what He says. It's His way. It's always His way. If, if God is anything, he's, he's specific and careful about everything. You know, it makes God very, very narrow-minded, which the, the world doesn't like, you know? What do you mean there's only one way to God? Well, He's God, which means kind of He gets to decide. Well, that's very narrow-minded. That's not very loving. I thought all worship eventually led to God. Well, hold on a second. As we said earlier, worship of anything other than God and God's prescribed way ends up in an emptiness, doesn't it? Why? Because it gives you nothing back. It can't save you. And and the only thing that's going to save you is doing it God's way. Now, I've heard it said this way, and I appreciate this answer when somebody says to me, that's so narrow-minded, and it's so unloving, and it's it's so wrong So you know, to, to think that way. You know, Salvation, obviously, from God's point of view, is a pretty serious matter. In fact, I would venture to say that in the life of a human being, it is the single most important event ever in anyone's life. There's nothing more important than a person's salvation. Eternity weighs in the balance. What could be more important than that? What is 80 to 90, 100 years of life on earth compared to eternity? It's nothing. So there's not a, there's not a single more important thing than salvation. Amen? Amen? So if that's the case, right, and, and we were to say, let's equate this to, you know, okay, your kid is, my daughter's 12, let's use 12. My daughter's 12 years old, and it's, she's finally old enough to be able to, you know, cross the street on her own. So, you know, um, and, and we're, obviously the street becomes a metaphor for, you know, between temporal reality and eternal reality. And I just sort of open the door and say, all right, you know, go ahead, there's the street, best of luck to you. There's plenty of different ways to get across. Hope you figure it out. No, no, no. There's going to be one very simple, very specific, very careful way that my daughter's to learn from me how to get across the street. That's how much I love her. He loves you so much, there's one way to heaven, and it's a very simple way. A way that you can't even pay for, he pays for it. And all he asks in return is your affection and your faith. Every other system of worship, check me on this, every other system of worship has some work available or or as part of its system where you have to earn or deserve something. All of it's false. Why? Well, because the Bible is very clear that in me dwells no good thing. All my righteousness is as filthy rags. It's altogether nothingness. Intrinsically, I am sin. There's nothing good. I was born a sinner, period. I can't give anything to God of any value because I don't have anything to give. That's what makes my salvation that much more glorious. All I can do is say, yes, Lord, I accept, I agree with you, I'm a sinner, forgive me, come into my life, Lord. It's not my life anymore, Lord, it's yours, and I worship Him with my life. That's what this is about. No strange incense on it. Don't try to come to me your way. Come to me the way I say, grain offering, no strange grain, no strange drink. Aaron shall make atonement upon the horns. We're speaking again about the the, uh, altar of incense. Don't put any drink offerings on it. It's not about that. It's not about, you know, fellowship per se. It's about, you know, these offerings of incense, a sweet-smelling aroma of... And by the way, we, we look at this. I'll give you some references to this in a moment that you can read later on if you like. But incense is a picture in Revelation of prayer, rising before the Lord, pleasing Him because people are speaking to Him. He's already spoken to us. He continues to, loves it when we talk back to Him. So Aaron shall make atonement on the horns of the incense altar once a year, putting blood, uh, the blood from the sin offering of atonement on the horns once a year. He shall make atonement upon it throughout the generations because it is most holy to the Lord. Revelation 5, 8, golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. The ministry at the altar of incense speaks of how God's people should continually remember the need to pray. Revelation 8, verses 3 through 4, describe the golden altar of incense standing before God's throne. It says, then another angel having a golden censer came and stood at the altar, and it was given him much incense that he should offer it with prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne of the Lord. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. What a picture. 
That began in the Old Covenant. Right there we see the beginning of that. You could not come any other way than by grace through faith at all times in the history of mankind. That's not a new covenant thing. That's the old covenant thing. I love what David Gutzik said in the Enduring Word commentary. He said, prayer is not the place of sacrificial atonement. It is the place where sacrificial atonement is enjoyed. Prayer is not a place where we make sacrifice to God. Prayer is a place where we enjoy the consequence, the fruit of atonement, because we have fellowship with God, the very desire that God has. And I'll say this again. I know I said it last week, so I apologize if you're hearing it again. But what did Jesus get? We know what he did. We know what we get. What did Jesus get? He died on the cross. He, gave his, he, he willingly gave up his life. But what did he get? There's only one thing. He got a relationship with us. He got a relationship with us. What more does he want than to spend time with us? Nothing. Nothing. 